it going? Welcome to your Friday. You worked hard for it and you deserve it. And women, it is all about feeling fabulous from the inside out with Fit and Fabulous. And of course, I'm so excited to have our guests on today. Uh, but first, say hello to Miss Jessa Jeremiah, the general manager of Wisconsin's 57 Girl Talk. How are you doing, love? Good morning. Love being here, Krista. Thanks well, for having us as always. I love you. Um, also, we have Janet Crescent. Girl, how are you today? Good. Did you like that photo I sent to you? The fit and fab. Someone's got the license plate. I love that. Oh, <laughs> and it's girl. not one of us. I said, <laughs> okay, who is this fit and fab driver? <laughs> They're big fans. So, uh, of course, a huge fans of Wisconsin's 57 Girl Talk. Jessa and Janet, uh, again, a lovely co-hosts. Uh, you girls actually started this bad boy. Tell people about this show if they're new to it. Oh my gosh, we have so much fun on Girl Talk. We missed you this week. Krista. I know, I'm sorry, love. Where I missed you, you. I know. Where where am I going? I don't know. Right? We'll have you back next week. It's all good. So we have a show where we get to showcase lots of great business owners in our community, nonprofits, and just some really fantastic women uh, in our community that are running businesses and doing great things. This week we had a particularly awesome show. We have been filming at Radiance Skin Therapy since our very first season. It feels and like home. I, oh, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Ann Pianka, the owner, is phenomenal. And every time we see her, she teaches us something new that is going on in the line of skincare. So it is just awesome. So if you want to learn about anti-aging, which yes. might roll nicely into our next conversation here with <laughs> yeah. Dr. Bartell, um, join us. It premieres on Monday at 4.30 p.m. and 10 p.m. We also talked finances. We had some amazing nonprofits on, Gilda's Club of Madison, oh, good, yeah. uh, Madison Reading Project. So it was just a great show all around. Love it. Except that you were gone. Except that I was gone. <laughs> no, that's so good. But again, uh, make sure you check it out each and every week. We are on Facebook Live. So hi, everyone. How are you? Ooh, ooh. You have two beautiful ladies that I get to look at. Now uh, let's talk about the stud that's sitting next to us. Thomas, I love you, honey. Dr. Thomas Martell, board certified surgical body recontouring specialist right here in Madtown, joins us once again. One of my dear friends. How are you, Tom? Good morning, sweetie. How are you? I'm very good. Uh, by the way, I just want to brag about you. Tomorrow, where are you flying out? Oh, come on. I'm going, we're going to Panama. I know. See you. <laughs> I love it. That'll be really, really fun. Uh, yeah, get out of here and go enjoy the warmth. So, Dr. Uh, Thomas Bartel, I call you Tom. You uh, are a brilliant doctor out here in Madison. And, of course, uh, you and I go way back now because I'm a happy uh, recipient of some beautiful implants myself. Uh, we'll talk about more of that later. But today is all about saline versus silicone breast implants. And uh, as I know, I understand you only use saline implants. That's correct. All right, tell us more about that. Well, I like saline a lot. I, you know, I don't have a fundamental objection to silicone. They're not unsafe. But I find that silicone it doesn't do as much as a saline implant can, at least in my hands, for a number of reasons. Saline implants, unlike silicone, are adjustable in the operating room. You know, a silicone implant comes from the factory, goes in the, to my office, goes in the patient, there's nothing I can do about it if I want to uh, adjust the size in any way. A saline implant comes with a minimum fill volume and a maximum fill volume, and I can use that range to first correct any asymmetry that I might see. A lot of women are a little larger on one side than the other. And if I don't think we've got the patient right up to this level that they want to be, I can do something at palate. I can't just, don't just have to throw up my hands and say, oh well. Right. Know, so I get them uh, where they want to be. And, and, and for that reason, I rarely ever hear the complaint, oh doc, I love them, but I wish I'd gone a little bigger. I rarely ever hear that. Wow, Good. it's interesting. Yeah, you talked about that last time a little bit about the adjustability. I found that fascinating. I think for listeners out there or anybody that's considering implants, there's always fear with that, right? And some concerns. And I think one of the big ones is the fear of rupturing. I've actually heard mm. of it happening, yeah. Sure. And talk to us about that. Does this happen very often? No, it's actually a very rare occurrence, but it can happen. Now, uh, it, it manifests itself in a number of different ways. For instance, uh, in a traditional saline implant, it's just a single lumen of saline. If it uh, ruptures, you have a deflation. One looks like this and one looks like it did before. And of course, we try to get you in as quickly as we can and get it changed out. Um, with a uh, with change the, out of flat. <laughs> change out. That's right. Change it out. Yeah. Now, with a with a silicone implant, though, you don't see that. We if, if it ruptures, it's called a silent rupture because it doesn't just deflate, but it's it's a rupture. And the really only way you can determine whether it's ruptured is with a specialized visualizing. Uh, 
test of some sort, usually an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you don't know it's ruptured, you don't know enough to take the test. And so there are literally tens of thousands of people out there right now with ruptured silicone implants. Also, the, uh, your insurance company is not going to be paying for that MRI scan, and that can get very pricey. Wow. Are the, the ruptures that happen with the saline, is that due to the actual device failing or due to some action that the owner took? <laughs> Good question. It is no. Is, it, the, oh, the, the you make it sound so technical. I know. Well, I'm <laughs> trying patient, to be proper here. <laughs> I, I tell my patients there's really nothing that they can do to cause these ruptures short of having, getting uh, attacked with an ice pick. Uh, I, I make the example that uh, I've been doing this for 30 years and I've yet to have a single implant rupture in a mammogram. Now, anyone who's old enough to have had a mammogram or know how they're done, know they give you a good squeeze. Yeah. So if they can't rupture them, you can't rupture them. Oh, no, the way these things rupture is, uh, is usually something called a fold failure. Uh, one of the potential complications of any kind of uh, implant surgery is something called capsular contracture. That's where the, the scar that forms around the implant starts to squeeze down and causes the implant to fold over on itself just a little bit. And wherever an implant folds over on itself is, can be, is a weak spot and that can fail. So that's where implants fail. It's not just they don't just spontaneously disintegrate. Okay, so back um, to the question of silicone versus saline. So some doctors seem to actually promote the, the silicone why would that be? Well, because they're, <laughs> it's a matter of, of entropy. They, they, they've always done it that way. They don't want to change. Mm -hmm. uh, they're uh, adverse to trying anything new. Um, and, and so they, and, and they have the, the, the misconception that uh, silicone implants feel more natural than saline implants. Now that's true if the two implants are sitting side by side on a coffee table. <laughs> <laughs> but that's not where they are, are they? No. They're deep Let's inside. <laughs> An implant, yeah. regardless of what it's made of, is simply taking up space, pushing what you naturally have forward. So what you see and feel on the outside is you. It's not implant. So it doesn't really matter what it's made of. It feels natural because it is natural. It's breast that you see and feel on the outside. So interesting, and you have so much knowledge. I think that's you know really helps to kind of ease any of the concerns that people might have. But you might still have questions going in, so you've answered a lot of them. What do you recommend for somebody who's coming in maybe for a consultation? What kind of questions should they be asking? Well, it's very important that uh, the, a potential patient know what kind of experience the surgeon has with the particular procedure they're interested mm -hmm. in. How many of these have you done? How often do you do it? What kind of complication rates do you have? That kind of thing. Well, they actually tell you that? complication rates? They are, if they're honest. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. You need a, a, a surgeon who listens to you, who, who listens to your concerns, who wants, who, who's actually interested in knowing what you're trying to accomplish, and then is able to express what they can accomplish for you. A lot of uh, uh, patients of mine come in from other uh, doctor's offices and they say, the doctor spent five minutes in there, he said what he was going to do and, and left. Uh, you know, didn't listen to me at all. Uh, you have to be able to connect with your potential surgeon. Um, the, the surgeon has to have a, a, a good team around them. Let's shout out to Dr. Martel's team since you mentioned that. <laughs> Listeners can't see his entourage, but they're here and they're fabulous. No, yeah. We got that. Lisa and Jane. What's up, girls? <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, I know this to be true because this is exactly what I went through uh, with the pre-consultation. And when I sat down with you, I let you know what my concerns are and what the things that were happening. And uh, it's very true. You, you know, I walked out of there having the answers that I needed. And I was able to see what you do, which is very important. You can say, oh, yeah, I do this. But if you can't actually show people that are coming in, I need to see what you do. I, I allow my patients to see multiple before and after shots yeah. of my work. And it's not just the, the very best work. It's just the typical work that I do. So they can actually see uh, what they're going to look like after surgery. In fact, on the website, you can even see a, quite a few mm -hmm. really impressive before and afters. And the thing that I find so amazing about the before and afters is there's no scars. Right. That's awesome. Well, for the, for the, for the uh, breast augmentations, that's true. You can't see any scars. Yeah. Wow. Glad you brought that up. Uh, let's talk about uh, an amazing implant out there. Tom, uh, again with my consultation, it, you said, girl, I have one for you, and it is called the Ideal Implant. Let's talk about this amazing one that is a... Uh, only so many doctors are able to do, and you are one of them. That's right. This is the latest, uh, newest implant out there. This is a saline implant uh, that was designed 
specifically to minimize the risk of rippling, uh, that is being able to feel ridges uh, uh, up from the implant, specifically for thin women. And um, anyone who knows Krista knows that she would qualify on those counts. This is a lean <laughs> machine. Uh, so so uh, that was the only aspect of a silicone implant that actually could boast an advantage over saline traditionally. That's not the case anymore. Now we have the ideal implant. This is an, uh, an implant that uh, feels and reacts more like a silicone implant in the, with respect to the rippling, but it still has the safety of saline. Um, so uh, I started uh, uh, about three or four years ago promoting this just for uh, thin women, but uh, more recently I've been uh, recommending it for just about everyone because I think it's a superior implant. Kind it's the wonderful. best of both worlds. It is. It's like. very natural feeling. The the profile I feel is natural. You know, I, I if I bend over, that was the real test for me. If I could see any rippling, because you've seen those women who just like have these boobs and there's like no elasticity to their skin and it, it, they look like balls on their. They just don't look good. Um, no. They just don't look good. Uh, so, but it is very true. Again, with the scarless, uh, one small incision each, in each armpit, and, and it fades. Yeah, yeah, and that scar that I put in, I, I you know put that right. In a little skin crease and eventually I'm not even gonna be able to find that scar if I can't find it and I know what I'm looking for no one else is gonna see it and no one okay. should be digging around in your armpits anyway no, no. <laughs> a valid point. so listen we are running out of time we are going to continue talking about the ideal implant and uh, very quickly uh, when it comes to uh, finding you Tom how can people go about that well they can uh, give us a call uh, 608-271-0500 is the office number or they can go on to the uh, our web page at drbartell.com and there they can learn all about the procedures I do and see all those multiple before and after pictures that I offer. Love it. Love you. Uh, again, we are continuing on Facebook Live, so if you want to ask questions about breast augmentations, we will get them from you or you can give us a call at 321-0931. Continuing with Dr. Bartell in breast augmentation, saline versus silicone, and of course my beautiful uh, friends here on, uh, of course, every single Friday with Fit and Fabulous from Channel 57 Girl Talk, Jessa, Jeremiah, and Janet Cresson. Love you girls. Thanks, lady. Thank you. There you have it, Fit and Fabulous with Chris in the Morning Rush. Thanks, Tom. Adios. All right, honey. On 931 channels. Is that what they say in Panama? I believe so. <laughs> <laughs> well, what did you say? Adios. Adios. Adios, amigos. Play store today. Search 931 channels and be a part of the station that sounds like So, again, yeah, you guys, uh, we're still on Facebook Live, so if you have any questions, we'd love to uh, hear from you. And, uh, again, with Tom, uh, he does the breast augmentations, and then you do other procedures, too. Sure, sure. I do basically body recontouring. Anything from the clavicles down to the knees is basically what I do. Clavicles to the knees. Yeah, it makes you think, okay. Well. All right. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing to the clavicles? How does that happen? <laughs> uh, so, Tom, when it comes to actual um, men, how, how many men do you see coming in to get the man boobs taken away? Well, quite a few. I and mean, lately, really? it gets it's more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 more and more all the time. It's, we want to thank you for that, by the way. Oh. Yeah, <laughs> yay! <laughs> yeah, this is a very common problem, and uh, uh, a lot of guys don't uh, don't advertise it that they are coming in, uh, and they they hide it very well. I mean, they, you can wear you can hide quite a bit with a baggy uh, sweatshirt. Is that a, a a genetic thing, or is it just a uh, extra fat? Are they overweight? What is that? It can be either a medical problem or a, a weight problem. And the vast majority of these are a weight issue. Uh -huh. uh, when, when, if you go on the internet and Google uh, this problem, you're going to get you find one word. It's called gynecomastia. Uh -huh. Well, <clears throat> true gynecomastia, I've, I've seen perhaps five times in my entire career. Uh -huh. Gynecomastia is enlargement of the male breast gland. Men have breast glands. We have nipples. We have breast glands. They're just not as developed as a woman's. A male breast gland is about the size of, uh, well, we used to call them a shooter marble. Uh, most <laughs> folks don't know what that is anymore. Kids don't play marbles. But a shooter marble is slightly larger than the regular marbles. That's the one they would use to, to, to flick uh, with their thumb and hit the marble out of the circle, and then you collect whatever comes out and put it in your bag. Uh, what I do uh, for uh, most men is start off with doing some liposuction because they're just a little bit overweight and some men carry their weight on their chest. So I, I do start off with doing some liposuctioning and then, but I do have to carve off a little bit of that breast gland. Because mm. once you remove the padding around the breast gland, now you can really feel it. 
So I carve off a little bit. This is usually done through a little tiny incision right around the areola, which is the colored area of the nipple. Um, and so this, it, it leaves practically no scars at all. So that's the vast majority of times that's the operation I'm performing. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. I haven't thought about men coming in. Okay. Yeah, well, one of my questions, I've never had to go under for any kind of reason and I haven't had any plastic surgery. So I'm curious about the process and my biggest, I think, concern, and maybe other people share this, is, is there, what are the risks of going under, do you have to go under, so to speak, for all of these procedures, and what is that like? You mean versus like a twilight kind of? Yeah. Yeah, uh, we do general anesthesia for just about everybody, and the reason for that is because it is so safe, doing twilight is really not a, a much safer than just a full general anesthetic. You're using the same medications, essentially, you're just not using as much of them. Okay. When my patient is under general anesthesia, the young lady who does the anesthesia is, has complete control over her. She, she's watching out her, her heart beat, her breathing, uh, everything that uh, has to do with her body function. She is taking care of that, monitoring that, so I can take care of what I want to take care of. And that way, uh, it, it, we run a very safe operation. I'll tell you, the most uh, dangerous part of the whole deal is the drive to my office. <laughs> You're wow. much safer on my yeah. operating table yeah. than you are on the belt line. That's right. good. No <laughs> argument here. Yeah. Uh, I'm glad you brought that up, too. When it comes uh, to the difference between your office and a hospital, is huge. It's, it's huge. Uh, you know, um, tell people kind of an experience of what that's like coming well, to your office. Uh, we're we're a, a fully accredited surgery center. Uh, I'll tell you what, the, the infection rates are a lot lower in, in a surgery center than in a hospital. No question about it because we're taking care of young, healthy people. But we're, it's very private. It's very personal. Uh, it, it's not this, this big uh, overall people running around rat race experience that you'll get when you go to uh, one of the larger clinics. So uh, I think we, and people want a personalized experience. They want privacy when they're doing something like this because this is a private uh, deal. So unless you're Krista. I was gonna say, unless you just wanna <laughs> for, throw for, it out there. For most patients. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Dr. Tom, how long have you been doing breast augmentation? How many, if you had to guess, like how many have you done over the years? Too? I've been doing it for almost 30 years. Oh my gosh. Uh, oh, I. I Thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands. <laughs> it's hard to tell. You want that kind of experience. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So if you're embarrassed about having to show your problem areas, Dr. Bartell has seen it all. And, and don't <laughs> and worry. Worse. And, yeah. and I always tell folks, no matter what you come in with, I've seen worse. Yeah. Oh, I love it. I love it. Well, once again, you know, Tom, you are uh, just delightful in, in every way. And you, like you said, you have this amazing staff that you actually picked yourself. That sets you apart from any other doctor out there. Most of the time when you go to one of these larger places, uh, the, the surgeon will uh, get a team assembled that happens to be on, on for that particular day. So they, he never knows or she never knows who they're going to put within in his room on any given day. And some of these people may never have seen the procedure done by that person, by that surgeon. So it's like reinventing the wheel every time. Mm -hmm. All I have to do is hold my hand out and I get the instrument put in it that, that I need next because my staff has seen me do this so many times, you know, it's just, it's just like uh, clockwork, mm -hmm. it just happens. A well-oiled machine. It well is. Well-oiled machine. And believe me, they are very good at what they do. Super yeah. sweet. Yeah. Uh, once again, we are so excited to have Dr. Bartel here. Again, if you're thinking about breast augmentation, I mean, that is his, uh, that's his thing, man. I'll, I have to tell you, uh, he definitely is your man. So check him out at drbartel.com. Uh, again, there's so many other procedures, labiaplasty, uh, you do liposuction, you do tummy tucks, he does it all. So uh, pick up the phone, stop on out and enjoy a free consultation again with Dr. Thomas Bartel. You enjoy your holiday, my man. Thank you. Thank you. I might even come back. <laughs> All right, good. We want to see you back. Again, thank you, Janet. Thank you, Jessa. And, of course, thank you uh, to Lisa. Uh, you can see her over there with our Facebook Live. And, of course, your beautiful sister, Jane. So uh, thanks, everyone. We appreciate it. Till then, until uh, next time. Thanks, uh, Shady, too. Uh, bye. <laughs>